Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Stuart Pemble, and I'm one of the partners in Mills and Reeves Construction and Engineering Team. And I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, the latest in our foundation series of webinars uh, discussing the, the huge challenge of net zero, what it is, how we deal with it, and in particular, the challenges that the construction industry faces in its day-to-day -day, uh, operations. The webinar is being recorded, and you will see that there are subtitles on the bottom of the screen to help those people uh, who might find it difficult uh, to follow what's being said. We will send you a copy of the recording and of the slides after the webinar. If anyone has any questions, there's an opportunity to, for questions to be answered by the speakers at the end please use the chat function in Zoom and uh, we'll use that to, to deal with questions. Next, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Introducing the second speaker first, if I may, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Carla Parsons. Carla is an associate in the project and construction team here at Mills and Reeve, but she also has a particular expertise in environmental, social and governance issues. I'm also delighted to welcome uh, one of the country's leading experts, Professor Sean Smith of Edinburgh University. Um, it's fair to say that Sean's devoted a significant part of his academic career to considering these sorts of challenges. And we're absolutely delighted and honored that he's chosen to help us on this webinar. Over to you, Sean. Thanks very much, Stuart, and a, a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, a huge thanks to, to Mills and Reeve uh, and the team there for the invitation to speak. Um, building towards net zero and what is it and how do we get there? Well, in 25 minutes, I've been very honest, I don't think we can cover every point we would like to cover. Um, but I do hope today we'll get an opportunity to touch on some of the key points, some of the considerations for the future, um, the sheer scale of the task ahead, not just in the UK, but internationally, uh, and some of the attributes and technologies and things to look out for uh, as we move ahead. Um, so we're just briefly going to touch on some common terms, which I'll be mentioning during the talk, the pace of mitigation. Um, aren't more trees the answer? Well, we'll have a little chat about that. Um, a big factor to come is the global growth in the coming years and why we probably need to act faster than we can on our existing stock and our existing buildings. Uh, touch on the UK emissions, the life cycle stages, scopes one, two and three, which will go into a bit more details, some examples and planning the journey. Well, first of all, net zero carbon um, generally is a state in which the emissions going into the atmosphere are balanced by the removal out of the atmosphere. And the UK government has currently set the target of 2050, as has Wales and Northern Ireland for achieving net zero carbon emissions. And this includes um, not just carbon dioxide, but all greenhouse gas emissions within net zero carbon. And what we do is we take all of these seven baskets as are known as greenhouse gases, and we convert them into equivalent CO2 or carbon dioxide emissions. And some common terms, uh, which also are going on just now, which you may hear carbon neutral, and this actually has a PAS document, which is a, a publicly accessible specification, PAS 2060. Um, what's very interesting is quite a few industries and public sector organizations are actually using and aiming for carbon neutral first because there is a structured document with PAS 2060 and they're seeing this as a pathway, as a contribution towards the future net zero outcomes. Fabric first is where we talk about the energy efficiency of our external walls and roof and ground floors, that's the energy insulation and the general feeling and general direction by most organizations within buildings and the built environment is to target the fabric first, because then that reduces the operational heat or energy requirements and therefore can open up other opportunities with the numbers or different types of technologies you may want to choose because you've reduced the amount of energy that you required because you've done an insulation fabric first approach. The other area around uh, net zero is offsetting. It's firmly believed that offsetting, whilst will be used in the short term, is one which most governments would rather that people didn't use. 
and that they actually reduced at source most of their emissions directly. Um, but in the short term, it's used as a compensating mechanism for an organization by making an equivalent reduction in CO2 elsewhere. And that could be paying for things like new forests or funding large scale retrofit on another agency, another uh, third party's property stock. And then as an, in effect, banking those equivalent CO2 or offset carbon reductions. I'd like to touch on, if I may, a couple of articles. Um, there is a, a, a free to access um, online magazine, so to speak, or article newspaper called theconversation.com. Um, theconversation.com has hundreds and hundreds of academics all over the world who write for it, uh, and there's articles every day. And I wanted to touch on a couple of points and a couple of articles which have appeared here recently. First of all, that quite a few climate scientists are coming to the, the prospect that the concept of net zero is also quite a dangerous trap. We almost might think, well, we will um, balance our emissions and that will be sufficient. And the general feeling amongst many of the scientists and climate scientists is in fact, net zero may not be enough. But today we were focusing on net zero and the directions that we need to get to, but we may need to bear in mind, we need to do a lot more. The graph on the right, uh, I should give credit to, and it's their diagram, uh, Robbie Andrew, who has been very useful in how he's actually shown what happens as each year goes past and we can't actually achieve the targets because we've started late. And what you see in the right hand diagram there is the time period that if we'd started in the year 2000 uh, and we'd started the mitigation adaptation or energy efficiency and our carbon reduction or CO2 reduction measures then, then that slope of each year's requirement to target our net zero and move forward would roughly be in about 4% per year. However, we're starting this journey almost 20 years, in fact, 20 years later, and you can see that the, the steep drop in that dark line reflects the acceleration of the measures of mitigation that we need to introduce if we'd started in 2019. And we are already in 2021, and there is a huge amount to do. And I think it's a very useful diagram to explain just how much and what speed of acceleration needs to happen to achieve our net zero targets. There have also been many discussions about offsetting. Well, we'll just plant more trees and we'll be fine. Well, planting trees absolutely does help, but there are just not enough trees in the world to offset society's carbon emissions. And even if we planted a considerable number more, it's still not going to be enough. So we cannot just look at planting trees as being an offset mechanism to absorb that CO2 and offset the emissions that we produce. Uh, and so it's again, a very useful article that appeared recently in the conversation. The UK forest actually currently has about one gigaton, one billion tons of, of CO2 that it's able to store up. But in fact, it's only 17% is really in the leaves and the branches and trunks of the trees. So again, we just have to be careful that we may think that trees are the answer to many things. They're certainly a great help, but we will have to tackle our built environment stock. A bit about the future uh, and hopefully not to scare people, but over the next 80 years on the horizon, the world's population at a medium trajectory growth as forecast as medium by the United Nations is expected to grow by about three and a half billion. Um, because of the aging population as well and people living longer and the lack of rotation of housing, of existing housing um, that's going on. The other issue is that the collective requirement is we need to build globally 2.1 billion new homes over the next 80 years. And that's equivalent to taking the entire 27 nations of Europe and all the housing that is there and multiplying that by seven times. So that's seven times the 27 nations of Europe, which we need to build over the next 80 years just to meet the oncoming horizon of global population growth. In England and Wales, over the next 10 years, they'll need to build 2.3 million homes. And that's like building the whole of Yorkshire and the Humber regions again. And in Scotland, for example, by 2030, we'll need to build 260,000 new homes. And that's like building the whole of the city of Edinburgh all over again. Our UK greenhouse gas emissions, uh, as shown here, are published annually. This is the 2020 report that shows the 2019 emissions for the UK. And as you can see, the vast majority is carbon dioxide, but there are also important other uh, gases there, methane, nitrous oxide, and the fluorinated gases. 
Collectively, it's about, um, well, a significant size of tonnage uh, of, of CO2 that's being emitted. And when we break that down by sectors across the different emissions, and um, whilst we have made great uh, strides in energy supply and reduction of energy supply in the sense of the energy emissions coming from that sector, shown by the red line, and the amount of renewables and the closure of coal-fired power stations, Unfortunately, despite all the other efforts that have gone on our existing stock, such as residential, we really haven't made much of a dent in what is a requirement that will have to shift quite significantly over the coming three decades to 2050. Net zero building, for example, has been around for a while and the UK Green Building Council uh, brought out a framework definition for net zero carbon buildings in 2019, where they focus on three areas, the net zero construction, the net zero operational, predominantly operational energy and home life. And some of our existing building stock numbers are sectors are interesting to look at. In the UK, we have about 26 million homes. Um, but what is a uh, differentiator across the four nations is the proportion of those that are flats or apartments. And, it, and it's generally more difficult if you have flats or apartments, particularly if you have um, different tenancies to address the retrofit solutions that you may need. And whilst England has 18% of uh, flatted housing stock, um, Scotland has 38, Wales and Northern Ireland 10 and 9%, the task will be varied across those four nations. And if we look at schools, for example, there are 32,700 schools across the UK, the vast majority are primary schools and secondary is about 4,200. But within that, that's just the number of schools. And remember, some of these schools will have one building and some of them will have up to maybe 15 buildings. And they have been built over a considerable period of time. The key life cycle stages of how we look at carbon and, and construction, we focus on, on the left-hand side, the upfront carbon. So what are we doing in our construction, our design stages, um, both in new build and also in retrofit? Um, in terms of the main focus by most people just now on their existing stock is on the operational carbon. And that's in a key and important area to tackle first when we're looking towards net zero. And finally, when we look towards the end of life, a very important stage, we should be just thinking now in any new build stock about the design for future disassembly. And in our existing stock, if we're doing change of use or refurbishment, such as changing as a result of COVID, the pandemic, there are city centres where office buildings will change to residential. Um, we really want to try and retain as much of that existing building and the building fabric or certainly the building structure core and avoid demolition. And that certainly helps balance and reduce the CO2 emissions and, and helps us on our net zero pathway. You hear a lot about emission scopes. And for those that aren't aware, there are three scopes. Scopes one or two are what most people will generally focus on because they're in direct control of those, so to speak, uh, and scope three are indirect. Scope one is your direct organisations under controlled emissions, such as your estate portfolio, your heating appliances and your own owned transport vehicles. Scope two are emissions associated with the production of the energy that is purchased by the organisation or by your company. And that reflects on the electricity generation which is purchased and the source type and therefore the emissions. Scope three is indirect emissions. These are not directly controlled by an organization or company, but the work that you do, the activities that you do influence these indirect emissions, such as your supply chain and the materials that you use and how they're transported, the business travel by staff. You don't own that business travel, um, it could be your staff's vehicles, it could be them using uh, public or other transport, but it could be a policy by which you can shape of what you do with your staff and under scope three and their commuting or business travel. And technologies race, well, no, we have to do fabric first, and this is the number one focus going forward. It is a key area for our older building stock, particularly those built pre-1919, which were predominantly stone-built systems or solid uh, brick walls. And now there have been some recent advances in historic and older 19th century buildings and retrofit and more solutions will come onto the market. Um, there's a big push just now for air source heat pumps, um, but before doing so, please ensure that you've done your fabric first approach has been maximized before you install air source heat pumps. 
We're hearing a lot about hydrogen just now, multi-million pounds of investment into particularly green hydrogen, which uses renewable electricity to generate the hydrogen through electrolysis of water. Predominantly, these have been focused on more large scale industrial public sector, including whiskey distilleries, for example, and, and Europe's largest um, hydrogen powered commercial building is the Aberdeen Conference Centre that was recently constructed. However, there are several housing hydrogen innovation projects on the go just now across the UK, and these are worth tracking. There are a number of new technologies which will come to the market soon, and with the shift from gas and the reduction of gas in the future for new build, and also the future reduction in gas consumption across the UK and the policies that may emanate from government, one of the considerations of one of the new technologies which is around the corner is the potential to use microwaves. Now, it's not quite the microwaves of how you heat your, uh, your food if you have a microwave at home in your kitchen, but it's using a similar type of technology, different type of, uh, of mechanism per se, but it's still microwaves. And this could actually assist that shift from gas, which therefore could be electric based and therefore may not require the multi-billion pounds of conversion of our existing gas network for hydrogen. Currently at the moment, the thinking is that we could actually install about 20% of hydrogen into the existing gas network without making too many changes. But we wait to see how these hydrogen projects go forward. Um, a couple of quick points about scope one and scope two. As we focus on our fabric first performance, we increase the fabric energy efficiency shown by this blue line with the increasing amount of insulation. And it gets to a point that you do get diminishing returns. So beyond a certain thickness of insulation, it actually may be less sustainable because you're really not getting much return. So those early phases of energy fabric efficiency and measures certainly reduce your operational carbon and decreases your scope one emissions. However, there's a more a linear approach when you're looking at scope two emissions and the source of your energy. And particularly the more renewable energy that you can install, then there's more a direct relationship with your operational carbon decreasing under scope two. The effectiveness and optimization of renewable energy heat sources for your building though, is very much interlinked, particularly for heat sources, to that first fabric energy efficiency approach that you take. Here's an example of a local authority who's looking at their greenhouse gases. They've set a very early net zero target uh, of 2030, and they're starting to stratify the different areas of heat power and water, and various other agricultural and forestry that they have within their, their land database and, and their land portfolio. And where are they now and where are they going to? And you can see on the top right, 63% of their emissions are coming from their buildings with about 8% from waste and 9% from their fleet. The bottom right diagram shows how the reductions have happened in the past. And that red, uh, almost diamond shape suggests where they may be in the coming year. But you can see by the projections, they're going to have to do a significant amount of change coming forward to deliver on where they're going for net zero for 2030, following the red line on the main graph. So the journey ahead and key actions, and on the right hand side, I'd just like to show, this is the same council that's then said, okay, if we're looking at our building stock, that top sort of blue, large uh, purple line is, is the amount of emissions. And they've looked at how they will cut their emissions with various policies and measures of retrofit and other areas, electrical efficiencies, expanding their PV and solar. And there is an area on the right hand side with that orange line. And um, this is the area which they know they still need to address somehow going forward, but they don't yet know how they will address it. And hence it's colored orange. And my general feeling and thoughts to everyone is don't panic when you have this. We do not know all the answers yet, but there will be technologies and solutions which will come forward. But as long as you know where you have those gaps and therefore what you need to address, then that is certainly a very forward step in looking at how you're going to tackle. So please don't panic when you do have these charts of, well, we've still got these emissions, but we still don't know how to, we're going to tackle those. So I'm just gonna briefly take you through in our leadership areas, so the key actions, data and tracking measures, and also your supply chains. Uh, apologies, I've broken all the uh, slide presentation rules and put more than three lines of text in, but I believe these are available afterwards. 
But anyway, in leadership, it's very important in every organization to appoint a responsible person for tracking all of the relevant missions which are going on. This is important for what's going to be coming ahead. Um, your uh, contracts and tendering, you're working with supply chains, you're going to want to know what your emissions are. Um, include your organization staff in discussions. Many of your staff, not in the senior management, many of the more junior staff may know some of the measures or areas where you could actually reduce some of your emissions quite, quite simply, and therefore involve them. Definitely knowledge share with other industry sector leaders and what they're doing. Absolutely, and the reason it's changed in color for its significance is budget for change and solutions. And I know in a post-COVID pandemic, or as we're coming out of the pandemic, we hope it's very difficult in the current economic climate to plan too much ahead. But certainly consideration should start to be given over in future years, should you be setting aside a budget for change and implementation mitigation measures. Definitely upskill staff at all levels where possible. And my strong suggestion is to undertake a SWOT analysis of all your existing processes and portfolios and operations. Through that, you will identify the measures that are potentially possible. And um, the third item of key actions around data and tracking, um, knowing your emissions and calculating, there's a number of free tools which are out there just now, and also the direct operational emissions uh, in, in terms of a key starting point for what you need to look at. Ensure the data is relevant and timely and uh, aligns with the, the same reporting period that you're looking at, whether it be six months or annual. Do seek expert advice if you don't have it available in-house. You may decide to consider both a carbon neutral um, portfolio pathway and also net zero. You may not jump to net zero straight away. And then remember to report and benchmark as you're going on your year on year reductions. Finally, for scope three in your supply chains, um, do liaise and work with your supply chains. Uh, in the last year, I've had more meetings with, with public sector and industry and chief execs than I thought I ever would have in this area. And one thing that they've all said is there's no point um, using a stick approach with our supply chains. They firmly believe it really has to be a partnership because everybody wants to work together to a common cause regarding climate emergencies. Consider all products and the services that you're using. And whatever you do, give your supply chain advance warning so they can prepare and work with you as you move forward. And as I finish up here, I just want to, uh, and it was just by sheer accident that the motto I put in here was the same, almost the same motto as Mills and Reeve, achieve more together. But Concordia Res Parve Resquent is if we work together to accomplish more collectively, there is a real opportunity to make good progress towards not only carbon neutral, but also net zero. And I'd now like to hand over to Carla Parsons, who's going to do the second phase of this afternoon's uh, seminar. Hi, good afternoon. As Sean said, I'm Carla Parsons and I am an associate in our projects and construction team here at Mills and Reeve. As Stuart's mentioned, I have a particular interest in ESG, environmental social governance. So I'm delighted to be speaking to you today about net zero and talking about some of the practical and legal considerations of how we can reach net zero. Apologies. So today I'm going to be looking briefly at first the legal background, some legal considerations, some aspects of funding to consider, and the project life cycle. I think if you take anything away from Sean's presentation, it's that we cannot avoid the fact that we need to reduce our carbon emissions and we need to reach net zero. The construction industry is responsible for around 40% of carbon emissions, and therefore it's vital that it takes a role in this and takes a leadership particularly considering the life of a building and the life of a project. So to look briefly at the legal background, when you're considering how do you get to net zero, how do you as an organization think about your targets, it's worth thinking about where we are, why we've got there and what considerations you should think about going forward. So the movement towards net zero has really developed from the UN starting back in 1997 with the Kyoto Protocol, 
in which nations committed to reduce their greenhouse emissions, followed by 2015's COP21, where the Paris Agreement came into being, where nations agreed to reduce their carbon emissions so that we could see a 1.5 degree decrease in temperatures. Now, since 2015, we've seen an increase in over 100% of environmental social governance legislation and regulation at a national, international and supranational level. Much of this relates to reporting and a great deal relates to climate change, which is clearly very relevant for net zero of what we're talking about today. And in November, COP26 will be held in Glasgow. And it's very likely that we will see an increased level of activity around the net zero movement. Many of you will be aware of Earth Day last Thursday in which many countries such as the US, Japan and France committed to tougher targets to achieve net zero. The UK was also one of those countries which committed to an increased action, re reducing carbon emissions by 78% by 2035 with the ultimate goal of net zero by 2050. The UK had already declared a climate emergency in 2018 and there have been numerous actions taken by the government to try and help us achieve this target and reduce emissions. For example, the phasing out of petrol and diesel cars and on a construction specific level, measures such as nearly, energy, nearly zero energy requirements for new, build, new buildings. Now you may look at the slide and say, EU, why have you put EU on your slide? We're no longer a member of the EU. But the EU have recently brought in the, ta the taxonomy rules and under that, if you are part of a supply chain in Europe, you will be required to report on your carbon emissions. Now, you may say, I don't operate in Europe, but if any part of your supply chain does operate in Europe, you will have a requirement to report on your carbon emissions. So it's really worth thinking about that as you're starting on a project. How will you report? And I'll cover that a little bit later in contract. Apart from litigation, sorry, excuse me, apart from regulation legislation, We've also seen an increase in action against companies and organisations who are not considered to be taking their climate change obligations seriously enough. There's been litigation against major organisations, including ExxonMobil, and against um, organisations such as the French state, who were held accountable recently for climate change. We've also seen a number of ESG class actions. For example, the Niger Delta farmers' recent victory against Shell in the Supreme Court. Now that was not about climate change and net zero, it was about pollution of water, but it was an environmental class action. So it's not a huge leap in the imagination to think that actually net zero could become something. And we've already seen a great deal of shareholder activism with companies not having taken their net zero targets seriously enough that shareholders believe that they need to take action against those companies. And of course, companies have their individual targets, which is what you as part of a supply chain or you yourself will be working towards. Oops, sorry. So moving on to funding. In the past few years, we've seen a huge explosion in ESG friendly financial instruments. For example, bonds. Bonds are a really good example of how ESG friendly instruments are increasing. The market is predicted to reach $650 billion this year, 2021. And that's across green bonds, blue bonds, social bonds, and sustainability linked bonds. So projects that are ESG friendly will find themselves with a wider access of funding options, as well as the traditional funding measures. Many bankers, investment managers, asset managers have signed up to various protocols and standards or organizations in order to achieve various ESG related targets, including equator principles, the UN principles of sustainable investment, the UN principles of responsible investment. And if they are going to fund your project, they will want to see that you're helping them to achieve their ESG commitments, which is very likely to include net zero. And finally, we have seen various public commitments recently to ESG, and this includes net zero. For example, last week on Earth Day, various um, asset managers, insurers and bankers came together to form their own net zero alliances. The Net Zero Bankers Alliance, the Net Zero Insurance Alliance and the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, 
showing that there's a real drive towards net zero and the major funders are really taking this seriously. Many companies are also expressing publicly the need to align their values with anyone they work with. And a really good example of this was the Deliveroo IPO recently. So Deliveroo, the food delivery company, launched their IPO, expecting it to be a huge success. But in the weeks running up to the IPO, many major asset funders and asset managers and investment managers publicly stated that they would not be investing in the IPO because they had concerns about Deliveroo's ESG record. Now, again, this is, wasn't about net zero. It was about their governance and their use of the gig economy. But it was enough to make major asset managers go, this is not for me. This does not line with the ESG values of my company. And we've on the converse side, many people are showing a commitment to invest and to fund projects that are ESG friendly. For example, NatWest have recently said that one of their forward thinking plans is to invest in social housing. So moving on to a project life cycle, Sean has already spoken about this. And I think one key takeaway from what he said is that we cannot think about a construction project in silos. We have to think about every stage as part of our attempt to reach net zero from the bid and tender stage to the end of life when we demolish or decommission a building. Now, one of your key areas in which you can really target net zero in a construction project is at the contract stage. This is in your definition of net zero. What do you understand by net zero? What do your suppliers and contractors and anyone you're entering into a contract with understand by net zero? Do you have the same ambitions? And I would draw your attention to um, the Chancery Lane project if you're not aware of it. It is a group of lawyers and law firms who have come together to draft climate change model clauses to go into contracts. Now, obviously, I would encourage you to take um, legal advice before incorporating any of those into your contracts, but it is definitely worth having a look at and of particular interest. I would draw your attention to Estelle's clause, which relates to um, net zero construction standards and to Owen's clause, which relates to cascading net zero targets down your supply chain. The clauses are all named after children because this is supposed to be looking at the future of climate change um, being climate change friendly and the future generations. Um, so on supply chain, it's really essential that you cascade your net zero obligations, requirements down your supply chain. And as Sean said, engage early with your supply chain and make sure you're all working to the same, song, same hymn sheet. The build is probably the most obvious way in which you can think about reducing your carbon emissions. For example, where do your materials come from? What materials are you using? Is there something potentially more carbon friendly you could be using? A really good example, which I heard this morning on Radio 4, was a Welsh company which make green cement. So that it's not only more carbon efficient, but if it's for a build within the UK, the transport, which is one of the biggest causes of carbon emissions, is going to be significantly reduced. Also, where is your labor coming from? Are they you bring them in from abroad or are they in the UK? So there's lots of things about the build that can really help make a difference to your carbon emissions. And it's not enough just to stop and say, the building's built, we're done. In order to be truly net zero, you need to think about how net zero fits into the life of your building. And Sean has spoken about that already. So just a few other considerations. What's the location of your building? If you're far away from public transport, you will be adding to those indirect emissions by asking people to drive to your building. And how are you reporting on the carbon emissions in its life cycle? One of our thoughts here at Mills and Reeve is that potentially it would be worthwhile considering at 12 to 24 months following your build, having a carbon evaluation or audit in order to confirm your level of carbon, are you reaching net zero, and think about what you can do if you're not. It is potentially something that could become a mandatory requirement, so it might be worth considering at this stage. And finally, retrofitting. As Sean said, if we don't demolish a building, if we can use it, if we can repurpose it, that is much better from a carbon emissions point of view. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Um, I've taken everything at very high level, but should you wish to discuss anything further, 
Um, myself or Stuart would obviously be delighted to have a conversation with you and see if we can assist you in any way. And I'm going to pass back over to Stuart now to take any questions. Um, thanks very much, Carla, and to Sean. Um, so yes, um, I, I mistakenly said at the start, please use the chat function. Please use the Q&A function if you have any questions, and I'll pass them on to uh, Sean and Carla. Um, one that has come in, uh, Sean, um, relates to the point that you made about, well, it's linked to both fabric first and the challenge of heating all of our homes. Uh, um, so realistically, what, what's the time frame for all of that? What does that actually look like? I mean, is it, you know, is, is the government going to cut off gas supply at some stage? Well, thanks, Jeff. I think we've got a bit more time with the gas. Um, but I think on the, the main feature is for the new build sector and the legislation which is coming through relative to uh, the non-use of gas in, in, in future new build construction. And um, we've got a few years yet, and the industry has a bit of time. Uh, and already the, the, the new build, new housing sector is already working on that to look at alternative types of energy solutions. Um, we're very fortunate that this sector, certainly the housing sector, um, has had a, 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 almost a pre-run at this in 2010 to, to 2016, when they were looking at zero carbon homes. And they were able to test a number of technologies also remove a number of myths about the performance of some of those technologies. And I think parts of the new build sector will um, almost be uh, pathfinders for some of the work that's coming. Uh, but the main issue is around the existing stock. And it then depends on the energy source and the types of technologies which are coming forward. I think the optimum would be if we could use as much of the existing infrastructure that we have without making too many changes. And perhaps the advances that will happen in boilers and whether it's through microwave funded boilers, uh, power boilers or other mechanisms, something which is as simple and importantly for previous studies of changing technologies and occupants behavior interaction with them, the most successful technologies are the ones where it's fit and forget. So if you kind of have an approach of fit and forget, it's a lot more easy this becomes a bit more difficult for passive because we're going to require people to change their ventilation systems for, the, for their filters for ventilation systems. But, but nevertheless, if we can as much as possible make the occupant's life as simple and straightforward as possible, then the faster we will get to where we want to go and their behavior and actions will come with us too. Many thanks. So a follow up from that that's come in as you, as, as you were, were talking. Do we have any example of the, uh, the uplift costs that, you know, the, the, you know, is there data to show what it costs, what the various interventions that could help reduce emissions actually cost? Okay, so we have seen costings for um, practically net zero for, um, this is existing housing, this is public housing uh, or housing association housing, uh, with, such as local authorities as well, um, whereby they've done some studies on the cost measures and you're talking, uh, in fact, I was in a, just a meeting two hours before uh, with the Zero Emissions Task Force with, uh, with, with one of the, with the UK governments here, um, relative that it was £15,000 per property. That was the minimum cost of the change. Crikey. Um, OK, um, I want to follow up now for Carla. Um, um, your, your idea of um, the sort of carbon retention reevaluation you know 12 to 24 months um afterwards any thoughts on you know will main contractors and subcontractors actually be able to afford this risk you know is there a bond an insurance solution um any thoughts as to how that might look or is it a work in progress i think that's <laughs> feedback i think it's certainly a work in progress because this is a new thing and this is something that's constantly in flux and in development but it's something obviously that we've thought about and Stuart and i have had various discussions about what might what might come down the tracks a bond would be something interesting um potentially putting something contractually in your contract to oblige your contractor to come back at a certain point there are a number of options and it's something I think that needs explored in a work in progress, but it's definitely something that we can see coming down the tracks. And it's something that um, 
that potentially Stuart and I could go away and think about a bit more and come back with an answer on, have a discussion and speak to some of our colleagues elsewhere in Mills and Reed. But I think it's a really interesting and good question. I think the, the three of us and we did, did discuss this in some length beforehand and um, we're not sure that any of us have a have, have a have a have a neat solution. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, um, I, but it's definitely something worth considering. Um, Sean, perhaps a, um, a a question for you uh, um, uh, from Mark Holden at Invigor. The Green Deal has failed spectacularly, and the Setter scheme appears to be way behind predicted outcomes. Um, any thoughts as to why these schemes struggle to gain, gain any traction? Well, gosh, that's a very good question. Um, there has been almost a, a, there's a graveyard of government policies around the whole area of, of um, whether it's zero carbon, whether it's the, the green homes, uh, the green deal, sorry, where it's the more recent uh, case where um, the, they had to close down the, the sector, the, the private sector support, uh, and, and shift that, I mean, it's not been lost entirely to the housing sector. The, the, the UK government has shifted that money towards public and, and social housing in the meantime. Um, there, there's a number of reasons why there's been failures uh, across both, both, all these schemes. Um, sometimes it's not having enough installers, sometimes it's not having um, approved technical solutions. Then there's issues with payments where you have a number of SME and small companies that are looking to undertake this work. They've invested to train and skill towards it. And then the funding which comes through either isn't sufficient or it's late. And sadly, a number of businesses went, uh, went uh, into receivership, into administration in this uh, last period. Um, I certainly think it needs, in my mind, a longer build up time. So people are ready for some of the solutions and what needs to be done, that the government then makes a commitment such as five or 10 years and will not unlock that commitment. It's a huge amount for companies to invest in, to, to deliver on this. And of course, at the same time, if Joe Public keeps seeing things being scrapped or start stop, then the issue is that we lose um, Joe Public, we lose society in encouraging them to adopt and to pick up some of these measures. So it needs a long term framework, probably beyond the normal cycle of Parliament. And I know for some politicians that may be difficult to to take in, but this is a long term pathway goal. Uh, and whether you're north of the border 2045, where you're some of the local authorities at 2030 across the UK who are setting net zero targets for then, or 2050, the key factor is that the support, the grants, the pathways, and the routes for new technologies to be able to access, be tested, evaluated, and then approved needs to be better for a much longer term goal. Okay, thanks. For that. A re-follow up maybe for both of you, Carla, with your wider sort of ESG um, background. A question from Andy Bailey. Um, uh, do, do we think there's enough investment in R&D looking at new technologies, products and materials? And, um, and then a follow up question from, from Claire Lunn. Linked to, do we think you know, she runs a, a laboratory and struggles to find alternative sources of energy to power things? Do we think there's going to be government or uh, international pressure put on manufacturers to offer equipment with alternative power supply? So broadly speaking, what do we see coming down the line and how is it going to be, how is it going to be delivered? Carla, any thoughts on that first? Well, I think there needs to be something because if we've got people who are trying to move in that direction and the government is saying you must move in that direction, the government will need to do something to enable that. Um, I, in terms of, and just looking back at the questions to remind myself, new technologies and materials, in terms of um, technologies and materials, I think there are, there are a lot of people out there wanting to make, to make movements in this area. And as we saw in the COVID pandemic, if you give people an incentive to do something and they know it's urgent, they will get on board and do it. And there's a lot of willing people out there, but it's perhaps finding the investment to enable them to do that as happened with, in COVID. Um, but I do think people want to do this. Um, we know that the government needs to do this. And as Sean said, it's not a nice to have, it's an absolute imperative. So I do think this will be coming down the tracks. And I think the government does need to support it if it wants us to get there. And thanks for that. And, and Sean, you said in one stage, don't panic. Um, so I, 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 I hope you're gonna follow that up with a positive message. 
Yeah, well, just touching on the technologies, th there's a lot of data, let's touch on fabric first. There's a lot of data out there. And what's happened is uh, on different performances of buildings and, and measures, the, the support mechanisms for R&D have been fairly sporadic before. That's not to take anything away from Innovate UK and other people that are trying to facilitate this, but there hasn't been a coordinated national approach to how we access that data, uh, justify it, third party certify it, that it really is doing what we expected it was saying on the tin. That's first and foremost. The next thing is we actually need a series of national technical solutions. We're very fortunate in this country, at least we don't live in Belgium, and I, that's no offense to people who live in Belgium, but so many house types in Belgium are so different. Whereas in this country, we're very fortunate that we have uh, key specific house types that were built in key specific periods. We know how they were built. It's then a case of creating the, as it were, the grand challenge of the series of retrofit solutions that we require. Uh, in terms of R&D, no, not enough is being spent. And I'm not saying that because I'm an academic. I'm saying it because I see the money that's being spent and it's a drop in the ocean with what's required. And actually that R&D, if we could spend more, would stimulate more jobs and generate the potential for more manufacturing in the UK into the green economy. So I would like to see a, a much larger investment for industry and universities to work together to collectively uh, deliver the solutions which are coming forward. Okay, thanks so much for that. And um, really, a, a sort of there are two questions that are um, uh, uh, one from Sam Lansdale and a, 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 a follow up from Andy Bailey about the types of materials that exist at the moment and quest, a specific question, particularly about timber and how does that work and are, is there enough source of it and can it be recycled? So, are there are there enough materials out there that will enable us to uh, achieve net zero, zero carbon, whatever whatever we set the goal as? Uh, I'll jump in first. The, the, the issue with materials, as I was mentioning about this global challenge over the next 80 years, is that actually there is not going to be enough material resource to meet, to build the for the 3.5 billion people. Um, that's why if we design for future deconstruction and disassembly and how we can reuse our materials and if we increase our circular economy approach to our existing buildings or infrastructure as we have to take them down if we have to, then that really helps support and um, that material resource. And um, currently um, we're seeing prices going up in a number of areas. This is for a variety of reasons, but specifically and, and currently at the moment on timber, there's been an increase in prices. There's a short bread, uh, uh, sorry, a shortage of, of chipboard in the UK just now. So people are, are switching to plywood. Um, and so this may go on for a while, but one thing is for sure, as more and more countries accelerate what they're doing towards net zero, the demand on some of these new technologies or existing technologies for manufacture, whether it be air source heat pumps or other areas will dramatically increase. And as we know that demand and supply issues will affect price. So in, if, in effect, the later you leave addressing some of these solutions, the potential, the higher the price that you will have to pay. Thank you. So Carla, a question for you as, as, as the representative of youth on, 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 on this panel from Bryony Martin. Do you think there's been a change in mindset over the past 12 months, which will help the journey to achieve net zero and if the answer to that question is yes, which particular aspects of this would you highlight? I think that's a really good question. And I do think that, I mean, not even in this past 12 months, but I think maybe the past two years, we've seen a huge shift in action and motivation in this area. I think even if you go back to something like Blue Planet with David Attenborough, when suddenly people stopped using coffee cups, you just need something that really wakes people up to, this is a challenge we have to face into. And since 2015, there has been so much movement in this area towards net zero. If you look at Greta Thunberg, if you look at Extinction Rebellion, the amount that we've seen those movements before then, you probably saw the occasional march, the occasional thing, but nothing was getting the traction that it's been getting. And I think last um, 12 months has been a really key time for this movement, as Bryony said, we've seen a lot more in the ESG space. So speaking slightly wider than just net zero, so if we think about all the protests that happened in the last year, the Black Lives Matter protests and so on, we've seen a huge amount of movement and action. And I think um, 
that net zero, as we move closer to COP26, there is going to be so much happening in that area. And now we have Joe Biden in the White House. He is doing a lot of things to move this forward. So in the past 12 months, we've definitely seen an acceleration, but I think it's probably coming from 2015. So in terms of which aspects I would highlight, I think one of the key drivers, like I've said, is public awareness. Social media plays a huge role in getting the message of people out there. Anybody can talk on the internet, anybody can make a blog, a blog, and make their voice heard in a way you couldn't previously. So I think that's really helping. Um, I think it's young activists like Greta Thunberg are doing a great job in raising awareness. And I think people are also just cottoning onto the fact of what Sean said, that this is something that is irreversible. We have to do something now. And it's almost like we've had a mindset change, but these things happen 20, 15 years ago. The, we didn't invest in ESG funds. That wasn't the right thing to do. The world has changed. So we are on a journey. We've not finished. There's a long way to go, but I think as these things like COP26 happen, we are going to see more and more, and it's a very exciting journey to be on. Thank you. Now, Sean, as the voice of age and experience on the, on, 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 on the panel, um, I said when I introduced you that, you know, you've devoted your academic career to this. And when we, you and I spoke about it, you said it was a sort of happy coincidence in many ways that this was now at the forefront. Do, I mean, what do, do you agree with Carla? Have things changed? And if so, what would what would you highlight? Um, they've definitely changed. Um... I, I know that it's certainly we've, we've all experienced, obviously, the changes with COVID, et cetera. But we now have um, a number of you know, cities, local authorities looking at 20 minute neighborhoods with this post COVID uh, kind of experience of what they see more people hybrid working from home, how that's feeding into their net zero targets and their plans, their future investment. Um, with the meetings I have, whether board level, um, CEOs, um, after COVID, the second thing on that discussion is um, net zero. Um, I have seen more recently draft documents for tenders that are going to be going out, which will include a requirement for those tendering to report on what emissions reductions they have undertaken in the last two years. As an example, because the organization that's purchasing this wants to know that the people that are coming to their table have actually, they're of the same mindset, coming back to what Carla touched on earlier. And I think also we will see changes in some of those tender documents and then the post occupancy evaluation of what was achieved, which I know that you've touched on also. Um, finally, I would say that there is a lot of goodwill out there to make this work at all levels. And that's a first that I've seen. You're seeing not one sector, but multi industry sectors trying to shift policies and strategies and pathways. Again, that's a positive. I think what we just have to be careful of is that the shouts of um, reductions and targets don't become the greenwash and that the people follow through and the organizations follow through. And that's why leadership at the top is so important across every organization to make sure it counts and that every contribution um, has a part to play. Thank you. We haven't quite got through all the questions. I think we can say that we will reply to them all and we will send out answers when we send the um, the the slides and the recording. So apologies to those people who'd asked questions um, uh, we haven't answered. I did try to uh, run through most of them and a couple of people asked a couple of questions and apologies if I, if I haven't got back to your, your second ones. I'm conscious of time. Carl, do you want to put the next slide on, please? Oh, we missed the... Um, there was going to be a slide advertising the web next webinar. Uh, you go back one, back one, back one more. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, uh, the next uh, webinar in our foundation series is on the 19th of May uh, from uh, four to five, dealing with payment uh, uh, and insolvency in the construction industry. Uh, Alex Pike, Neil Smith and Patrick Wishu from Mills and Reeve are going to be speaking in that. And there's a link that uh, are there to, to register. Um, next slide, please, Carla. Um, there is an opportunity to uh, give feedback. We would genuinely we'd, uh, love your feedback. Do please give it to us. Another thing to announce is that um, uh, following on from this uh, webinar, 
uh, we're going to be publishing, or Carl and Sean are going to be publishing a follow-up report going into a bit more detail on some of the issues that, um, that, 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 that we've discussed and uh, it will summarise uh, the, the, key, the key points, hopefully, in a, in a, in a way that um, um, uh, uh, will, will really resonate. And as people who signed up to this webinar, uh, you will be sent a copy of that. Um, finally, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you all for attending. Uh, we really value and appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank Carla and Sean for all their really hard work uh, and, and, and effort in presenting it. So thank you very much to everyone and wishing you all uh, the very best for the rest of the day. Thank you.